emphasize particular aspects of our Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, participants, a warm welcome to all of you and all the panelists and the participants. This is the fifth webinar of the FAO COVID-19 and Food Systems Series. This webinar is possible thanks to the joint collaboration between FAO and the CARICOM Secretariat. Today's webinar will focus on enabling agricultural investment in the Caribbean for an effective response and post-COVID-19 recovery. We all are aware that the Caribbean's food imports, food production, and overall economy is threatened by potential disruptions and shortages that could be caused by COVID-19. This is what makes this seminar of importance today. The seminar is being broadcasted via FAO YouTube channel and through FAO's capacity building platform. For those participants of you who are registered through the FAO Capacity Building Part Platform, you will be receiving a certificate for your participation. The seminar is gonna run for about an hour and we have two main parts. In the first part, we will have four brief presentations to stimulate thought and discussion on the main issues that bring us here today. The second part of the webinar will have questions formulated by regional experts. Following that, we are going to open the floor to take some questions from you, the audience, as posted on YouTube. Now, to get through the packed agenda today, in the limited time frame, we are going to ask that all panelists follow the time that is assigned to their presentations. And I will give you a gentle reminder when you have two minutes left. This being said, let's move right into business. I give the floor to Mr. Julio Berdegue, who is the FAO Assistant Director General and Regional Representative for Latin America and the Caribbean. Mr. Berdegue, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Gillian. Welcome all of our distinguished panelists and commentators. Above all, uh, welcome to the over 300 people who are listening via YouTube are participating in this webinar. This is a very good participation. Uh, in, when we did uh, similar webinars for Latin America, we had about you know, three times as many, but considering the proportion in the population, we have a much greater uh, relative population in this webinar than we've had on the Latin American side. So this is very, very encouraging, a good starting point. Uh, the meeting today is gonna be driven by the presentations and the talks of seven distinguished colleagues. We have the honor of having two honorable ministers, Mr. Saboto Cesar, Minister of Agriculture, St. Vincent of the, and the Grenadines, who is also the chair of the CARICOM Agriculture Sector COVID 19 response task force. Welcome, Mr. Saboto Cesar. We also have the Honorable Minister Michael Clifton Pintard, Minister of Agriculture and Marine Resources of the Bahamas. Thank you for coming today, sir. Accompanying the ministers, we have Mr. Joseph Cox, CARICOM Assistant Secretary General for Trade and Economic Integration in the CARICOM Secretariat. Mr. Maximo Torero, Chief Economist and Assistant Director General of the FAO. Dr. Patrick Antoine, representing the Caribbean private sector organizations. Dr. Jeremy Stephen, a distinguished economist, and our dear friend, Dr. Lister Fletcher, lecturer in biometrics at the University of the West Indies. 
Without further ado, I would like to give the floor to my dear friend, Chief Economist, Dr. Maximo Torero, please. Thank you very much, Julio. While Mr. Torero is putting up his, his um, presentation, I just would like to advise that Mr. Torero is the Chief Economist of FAO, and he will proceed. Mr. Torero, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope you can hear me well. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and what I will do is a brief presentation on how we uh, assess the situation of, 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 of seeds in general, but specifically on the Caribbean islands. As you all know, uh, COVID-19 has been affected uh, many countries in the world, and it's also starting to affect countries which are suffering problems of under, undernourishment. But the major problem uh, for the region or the countries we, we, we are all together meeting today is the fact that there will be a significant problem in terms of economic activity. So the first phase uh, of the problem, we, we have split uh, COVID-19 in two phases. Uh, the first phase of the problem is a situation in which we had lockdowns because of the health issue, and those lockdowns create a problem in the side of the supply. They create what we call a supply shock because of the logistical issues of people having to be staying in their houses and, and also businesses has, having to be uh, closed down. And that substantially affected one of the major uh, activities that are, are, are done in the Caribbean, which is tourism, for example. But also affected all the agricultural sector in the sense that we didn't have activity happening at that point. But similarly, we also have, uh, and what we are facing in phase two, is a demand problem. It's a, it's a demand side shock because of the potential recession that we will be facing in different countries. So what I'm going to do is take a little snapshots of each of the situations and trying to, to situate how we are today in terms of, of the two phases. So on phase one, the most important thing that we need to understand is that supplies of staple commodities are good. They are double of what they were in 2007, 2008 in, during the food price crisis. And, and also harvest has been extremely good. So there shouldn't be any problem in terms of availability of food. Uh, it, there were some initial logistical problems in the first two to three weeks of the lockdowns, but those were resolved. But that uncertainty created a, a problem in terms of trade. Why? Because some key exporting countries start to put some trade uh, constraints. The first one was done by Russia on wheat. They put a quota, but the quota was big enough that it didn't affect international trade. And the second one, which was more important, was the one put by the rice quota put by Vietnam. And that affects Thai rice, which affects the price of, of, of rice because the market is very thin. But the good news is that that quota of rice is now over since the 1st of May which have reduced the number of countries. Uh, if we look at today, for example, here I have 14 countries. Today we have 10 countries with restrictions on food, which only explain less than 5% of the share of the global export. So in terms of the trade flows of a staple commodities, we are not observing more problems anymore. Commodities are flowing, vessels are moving. The situation is a little bit more complicated on the high value commodity side, and that's where we are facing some constraints still because of logistical issues. And the reason is because the high value commodities are labor intensive and they are perishable. And therefore it's very difficult to move those commodities. And that is affecting many countries right now. And that's why we are observing increases in losses, especially uh, pro produce left in the field or problems in the, in the processing plant like the meat plants where we are observing it in the US. But what is the biggest problem and where, where we are really concerned? That's the second phase. And the second phase is a reflection of uh, the potential decrease in GDP growth. And that directly affects uh, your countries uh, because your countries depend on tourism from the north, mostly from the US and from Europe. Uh, and this is the, pro the preliminary projections that the IMF did uh, where they say that the global growth will be reducing in minus 3%. But the important thing is to look at the countries that from where the tourism is coming, which is from the US and the European area and partially from Asia, where the decline is significant. And this could end in simulations like a decline in the GDP growth for, for the Caribbean region of around 6.2% uh, by 2020. So it could have a significant impact, the, the significant decline in GDP growth. So this will substantially be distributed across different countries in the world, but our concern here is that this will affect uh, the countries in the Caribbean region, in the islands, because of the significant reduction in GDP growth. Now, when we simulate the effects of this reduction in GDP, and we, we are working with three scenarios, a 2% reduction in GDP, a 5% reduction in GDP, and a 10% reduction in GDP growth. And we are only doing it for low income food deficit countries and net food importing countries, and the Caribbean and net food importing countries. 
And as you can see, the number of undernourishment could go from 14.4 million to 80.3 million if we have a GDP decline of minus 10%. Now, people think that this is not, that the GDP at the global level won't decrease at 10%. And it could be they are right, and we hope they are right. But if there is a second wave of COVID-19, the probability that we get close to minus 10% is pretty high. But at the country level, uh, in many countries of the world, these numbers could be attainable, and that's something to really concern about. Now, the, the population below poverty line in most of the of the, of the seats, and, and especially in Caribbean islands, is still we are, they are facing some significant problems in terms of, of, of poverty, especially Haiti, uh, which is facing significant rates of, of poverty. But what, what is the, the concern and where we are worried? We are worried on the dependency on tourism, as you all know. We are worried on the level of external debt that the countries have. Uh, and how this will affect the capacity of the country to be able to import the food that they import every day, or what other options we have to cope and to increase uh, the resilience of, of this country. So this table is showing what is the level of financial assistance needed by each of the islands to try to see how we can work with multilateral organizations like the IMF to find solutions to, do, to this. And the IMF is opening several mechanisms to support in, in the sense to provide the financial support that will allow to cope for the period of the base of the EU uh, of the recession that we will be facing. Why is so important? Because of the decline in tourism that will be affecting the region substantially. There is a substantial collapse in tourism that will continue for a significant number of months because the only way that tourism will be reactivated will be if a vaccine is identified or if a cure is identified. And we know that the vaccine won't be available from 12 to 18 months. So that's the, the time of the lower part of the U shape that you will be facing and where we need to be careful about it. Not only that, that's excluding the, the recession. So let's assume that we find the vaccine, as some presidents say, by December. The recession still will be there and that will also be affecting uh, the, the tourism. So, so we need to be thinking on those type of scenarios and how to cope with those. And, and the chop will be significantly higher. And now our expectation is that we are talking of a recession that will be more than 12 months, like initially was thought that the recovery will be very fast, but this is not seem to be the case. Now, in addition to this, some of the Caribbean economies also uh, are, are, are economies that are exporters of primary commodities. Uh, and this is also being affected because of the decline of commodity prices. And this is affecting Guyana, Suriname, and Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, and this is making them to reduce uh, fiscal revenue. And oil importing countries, on the other hand, will be bene benefited because of the lower price in oil. But that's something that we need to look. But the second problem, uh, which is really important, is the case of the, of the remittances. Uh, uh, what we are very concerned also is the importance of remittances uh, in, this, in this region and how this could be affecting also uh, the situation. In average, there is 7% 7, 7 of seven percentage of the Caribbean region now put uh, an exist six fifteen percent of the GDP in the case of Haiti and Jamaica. So it's seven percent of the GDP and and fifteen percent in Haiti and Jamaica. So the reduction in remittances has been estimated in around twenty percent uh, by the World Bank. Um, it could be even higher, and that income flow that allow households to be able to access uh, food is going to be restricted. So. Our position is that we need to be very careful in how we use the scarce resources in the region and how we can cope with these elements that is affecting these islands, which is basically the slowdown of economy, the collapse of the tourism, the reduction of the remittances, being food net importing countries, and also very vulnerable to climatological shocks. And those dimensions makes the situation more complex. Now, what to do? We have been developing a series of briefs uh, and a series of roundtables to try to support the countries on the policies to be able to implement. But this Mr. policy Terrero, is basically- you have two minutes. Yeah, I know. Uh, this, this is basically uh, organized first in looking at the most vulnerable populations. And in the case of the, of the islands, we need to look at all the level of unemployment that will be generated because of the collapse of the tourism and because of the reduction of remittances. So it's very important that the islands assess carefully where to target their their social assistance programs, because it could be that they would be very different to what they used to have. And that's very important. And that's where we think we can deploy tools like the food insecurity experience scale to assess where the most vulnerable people in terms of food insecurity will be. And there is a several set of, of policies that can be put to do that. 
But one of the most important things is to assure that there is production on the smallholder side. And I think that's the core topic of, of this seminar. And that's where we need to find solutions using crop calendar to help at least farmers today to be able to harvest what they can harvest or to be able to plant what they can plant. Where we need to be very worried is on anything related to trees, fruits, and so on and so forth, because that is not endogenous to the situation. So trees won't be able to be reduced. Therefore, they will have the same produce despite the demand will be smaller. And that could create significant losses. Like if you produce mango trees, the next year you will produce the same amount of mango, but the demand will be half of that. And that could increase substantially losses. So we need to be very careful about that. But also it's important, especially in the case of the Caribbean, to look very careful at the macroeconomic side. Because of all the elements I have mentioned and the, and the, and the great capacity of a reduction of revenues on the countries, so it's very important to find fiscal tools and financial mechanisms through the multilaterals to be able to support the countries to assure the liquidity. So with that, I stop. Thank you very much. Maximo, thank you so very much. That, that was very accurate to the time and, and very good um, start. Very stimulating conversation. We're going to move very quickly right now to Mr. Joseph Cox. Mr. Joseph Cox is the Assistant Secretary General for Trade and e Economic Integration in the Caribbean, in, sorry, in CARICOM, and he has more than 25 years of professional experience in trade and economic issues. It's a pleasure to have you here with us, and we're going to pass you over for 10 minutes, pass the floor over to you. On you go. Okay, good. Thank you very much, um, Gillian. Um, what we're looking at here is, as we move through the blueprint for transitioning to the post-COVID economic recovery, meaning how we look to reopen my economies, we have to, first of all, take cognizance of what the picture is now, right now. As at yesterday, we are looking at 1,120 cases of COVID in the region. The prevalence rate is, um, the minimum is 0 0.009, the test per thousand, is between 0 0.10 and 12.5. The case fatality rates are 0 to 12%, and recovery rates are 11.9 to 90%. Um, those are details of the per country scenarios. But what we have to look at is that we are working in a region whereby there's a very high rate of informality ranging between 40 and 60%. But to date, the um, the region's governments have spent anywhere between one to 4% of GDP on the COVID outbreak. Our fiscal multipliers, we have to recognize, are weak. We have high un underemployment levels and high debt levels. And of course, our um, labor force, um, the wage rates are relatively low, and we have persons arguably, arguably between 50 to 60% of them are within one chip paycheck of poverty and our savings rates are low. Having said all of that, what we're looking at as we move forward and trying to get out of this scenario and adapt it to how we will treat with agriculture in its broadest sense is that we're looking at one of three models. We have what we call a laissez fair model, which is basically a scenario whereby you release, you, you relax all the restrictions and just reopen your economies We'd probably save some exceptions for the most vulnerable. Now that has all sorts of inherent risks because what you're talking about both culturally and practically, because what you'll be looking at is isolating, for example, your vulnerable and elderly groups for many, many, many months at a time. There's also a higher rate of um, the transmission risk would be very high and you, you, you'd likely have a spike which could overwhelm your, city, your scenario. On a zero risk model, what we're looking at is a situation where you're waiting until a vaccine. And as the previous speaker um, recognizes, 12 to 18 months at best, at, at best. And the truth be spoken is that that would mean that you'd have to be able to enforce your lockdowns, et cetera, for a considerable period of time. And with the high rates of informality, et cetera, that was referenced before, it would make that impractical for implementation. So where we're going now, is that we're looking at a graduated model. The graduated model, of course, will be based on continued assessment of your transmission risk, and therefore you will be moving forward on that basis to see how is it that you're looking at, how you'll be able to reopen your economy, how is it that you'll be able to restart your sectors. 
um, and on that basis, you will be moving forward gradually and in a measured, um, relevant way. Because we take into consideration that COVID-19 is not going anywhere and a second wave is indeed predicted. So the approach that must be taken must be coordinated and comprehensive. It is underpinned by effective communication. And in that respect, we have to look at when you're looking to reopen and when you're looking to move forward with agriculture and the attendant um, sectors or industries that come from um, that, we have to look at communicating to, for example, our manufacturing or our distribution base as to how is it that they need to reconfigure their factory floor their, um, or their processes to ensure that we still have the requisite protective mechanisms in place to ensure or minimize the possibility of an, of an additional outbreak. We have to, of course, speak to the preservation of confidence and stability in it because in this dynamic, what we're really looking at, we are looking at two different sets of customers, so to speak. We're looking at the internal customers and the external customers. Your internal customers, of course, are your workers and your external customers, well, be it if you're talking about tourism, is the tourists coming in, your, your um, customers who go to the stores or markets to, to buy produce or whatever. All of those persons have to have at least a reasonable sense that they will be um, protected, or, or you will find that the employees just won't come to work, frankly speaking, or the level of absenteeism, as they are recognizing now in China, is, is, is indeed growing. You also have to allow for differentiated measures at a national level for implementation. And of course, you have to take into account the interlinkages and spillovers from your various groupings. So what we have come up with, we have come up with a set of defined metrics. I won't spend a lot of time on this, but we have come up with a lot of a set of defined metrics that would uh, allow for harmonization across the region, um, whereby, so even though you allow for differentiation at the local level, it will still have an overall framework that we, within which we are operating. Um, but of course, we have to low, low focus on what exactly is a functional state of readiness? For you, to, for you to really get into that, you have to look at a scenario whereby um, you're setting up a grouping whereby you have widespread consultation. And I would urge in this type of scenario that you would have to include, for example, your political directorate, your political opposition, your private and your public sectors, trade union, civil society broadly defined, for you to have the kind of buying and a, and a transparent process that, um, that is required uh, uh, in this dynamic. You have to look at, um, of course, all this is underpinned by your robust communication. We're also advocating um, that certificates of operation and the requisite health protocols be implemented. Certificates of operation would be impinged on people literally um, certifying that you are ready for opening after you have taken into account the requisite strictures, um, social distancing, hygiene protocols, et cetera, that would be necessary for you to move on. And of course, that would be underpinned by your monitoring and evaluation mechanism. But to, for you to functionally restart in your business and to really drive the process forward, you, it would seem to me that one of the things that you would have to operate with is what we call a, a detailed relaunch map where we have to do a country by country, location by location, market segment by market segment, customer by customer, product by product assessment in order to prioritize recovery opportunities. The map of course would guide your production and supply chain and market and sale, marketing and sales endeavors to help to determine a recovery timeline for each of your um, locations. We we'll have to look at the enablement of management and owners, et cetera, to reassess their investments and projects um, for tweaking their value, value chains. And you must have a baseline opening scenario as well as a toilet scenario in the event that upon reopening, you end up with a spike and you have to end up with, uh, there is a risk of, of course, the renewed con contagion. So the market, we have to also look at segmenting your client base, between whether it's being business to business or business to customer. And you have to recognize, how is it that you're gonna be treating with a reviving of demand? There are a lot of the demand, there has been a shift in demand during this period that we are in, whereby some people have become 
more, um, they, 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 they seek out some of the more processed foods that they can get from imports, et cetera, et cetera. And that creates a challenge. We also have, Hawks, you have two minutes. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> we also have to look on the scenario whereby from what from our earlier read of this process, whereas it, there are other factors that are involved in terms of the agriculture supply or the food supply as at this point in time, we do not necessarily have a shortage. What we have is what I argue as a misalignment of demand and supply, which we therefore have to correct. So by, by and large, as we look forward at rebooting and treating with it, we have to ensure that we secure our supply chain in terms of strategic procurement. We also have to look at strengthening our, our ability to anticipate and meet demand and set out the phase recovery um, processes. I recognize that this is not gonna be happening overnight and we have to plan and plan very effectively. Uh, seeking, because as we go forward, and this is where I'll end, Madam Chair, as we go forward, we have to recognize that we have to treat with frontally any of the aftershocks that will emanate from the COVID-19 um, crisis. At this point, I rest. Thank you very much. Um, well within your time. We very much appreciate a very thoughtful presentation and highlight the Amen. idea of cooperation and communication all hands on board. We're going to move right now directly into our next presentation, which is by the Honorable Saboto Caesar, who is the Minister of Agriculture of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. He is also the, minister, the chair of the CARICOM Agriculture Sector COVID-19 Response Task Force. We're very pleased to have you here, Minister, and we are looking forward to your words. You have 10 minutes and I will do the customary two minutes. You have the floor, sir. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And I want to recognize my colleague, Minister from the Bahamas, the representatives here from the CARICOM Secretariat, the FAO, all definitely I'm sending greetings from the government and people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and from all they had working ministries of agriculture here in the OECS and in CARICOM. Definitely it is a period that is unprecedented, and there are significant shocks that we are facing many of which we have never seen before. In fact, we are seeing where many of our member states in CARICOM are experiencing drought conditions amid COVID-19, and we are moving into the hurricane season in a matter of weeks. However, agriculture, fisheries, this Minister, we've lost you for a moment. Your voice. Are you We're unable connected? to hear you, Minister Sabota. Minister, we've lost you for the moment. We're not able to hear you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to try and get that back as quickly as possible. Um, our technical team is working hard to try to follow up and, and get us to be reconnected. So let's give them just a few minutes here quickly. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, while we sort out the issue with Minister Caesar's connection, we're going to quickly turn over to our next presenter and then we will come back. So our next presenter is from the private sector and he is Dr. Ant Patrick Antoine, 
and he is an expert on issues related to international trade and economic policies in agriculture. We invite Minister, Mr. And Dr. Antoine to share his presentation with us. And you have a maximum of 10 minutes, sir, while we sort out the issue with Minister Caesar's connection. Dr. Antoine, can you be begin, please? This is presentation, so yeah. uh, We believe that, okay, it's coming now. The presentation from uh, Minister Sabota was still, still up. So yes. we're trying yes. to, we're trying to, we're trying to replace it. Okay. Um, Minister Caesar's office will, will stop sharing and then we can um, get your, your presentation. Right. In the meantime, let me just advise that we have more than 500 people that have joined us by YouTube and we're very happy for that. Um, we are collecting your comments. We understand that there's a little issue with the sound and we're working on that as well. Please do share with us any comments that you have and any questions that you might have for our presenters. Okay, what we are you. planning to do is we will gather what we can and when we do have time, we very much want to ask the presenters um, your questions on your behalf. So Dr. Antoine has begun to share his screen and we are going over to him now to begin his presentation, even as we try to sort out what is the situation with the presentation of the Honorable Minister Caesar. Dr. Antoine, over to you, please. Moderator, thank you very much. And on behalf of the chairman and the executive of the, Car of the Caribbean uh, private sector um, organization, it, it, it gives us a tremendous pleasure to be making this presentation to you. Um, very quickly, the CPO was uh, created by a uh, decision of heads on the, at the 18th special meeting in Trinidad and Tobago in 2018. And of course, by, by that, the heads, uh, delivered on a commitment that was long contemplated by the region. The theme this morning we think is extremely important and the way we want to, to do this is to see that there are some major issues that the region's grappled with for some time. And uh, at this juncture, we want to leave three key messages behind. I think the first one is that the next 10 years will be critical for the Caribbean. Uh, not just uh, because of the period that we engaged in, but, but it will define what the Caribbean looks like in terms of investment going forward. I think the second message is that the private sector's involvement in the unfolding scenario of growth and employment and economic activity is going to be absolutely indispensable. We call it a sufficient condition for success. And the third message really is that investing in agriculture continues to be a very strong strategic move. Uh, agriculture has been recognized and agri-food has been recession proof and you know, we now know the, the dictum of many, many countries that, that if, uh, if there is a recession people must eat. So for us, uh, Minister Sabota started getting into the matter of the trade statistics and we won't therefore repeat that. We're going to leave it for him to, com to complete that, that process only to say that uh, we are talking about a region where about 17% uh, of our uh, of, of our imports are sourced intra-regionally. Uh, it's important though, the third point I'm going to make is to understand what that means. It, it means that when you look at the rest of the, uh, the integration groupings and you put CARICOM alongside them, uh, as it turns out, CARICOM does not perform out of sync with other integration groupings in terms of the ratio of uh, agriculture to non-agricultural uh, exports or imports, nor does it uh, perform in a disproportionate manner in relation to agriculture versus intra-regional agriculture versus intra-regional total trade. The issue becomes uh, the, the, the nature of the connectivity that CARICOM has with the rest of the, with the, rest of the, of the world and, and, and what the statistics do show, which is important for us today, is that CARICOM is weakly uh, connected with the, with the rest of the world in terms of global value chain, so that uh, really, it's important for us because of the third point, to focus both on what we do in relation to exports, and that has to be important in this, uh, in this dispensation, as well as what we do in terms of displacing imports, because uh, you can do one and get very strong performance interregionally when your connectivity with the global value chains 
in fact declines. And I think the next point for us very quickly is that um, uh, the CARICOM agricultural regional groupings by import show that there are a number of groupings that are uh, essentially becoming more important over time. And um, those groupings, uh, when you look at their trade performance, when you look at their intra-regional trade, you're seeing that their intra-regional trade performance, again, even where it's consistent with CARICOM, when you look at what's happening with their intra-regional trade versus uh, what's happening with the rest of trade, they are, in many instances, 13 times more connected. And in some instances, they're 10 times more connected, while in the case of CARICOM, you will see from an earlier slide that CARICOM is only 2.9 times uh, more, more connected than the others. And I think for, for us, uh, the important point was made earlier about where we are now in relation to tourism. And if you look at the, uh, the evolution of CARICOM trade over time, you will see that um, CARICOM's imports have gone up because our tourism has gone up. And now that our tourism is going to be declining, it will hold major implications for food supplies domestically but also for imports. So that's important because in looking at what the future will look like, we can't simply predicate it on what the past will look like in terms of import performance. And I think that's a, a point we want to get back to later. What has the private sector done having regard to everything I've said? Well, we've said based on a decision by heads that there are a number of things that we want to uh, look at large investment opportunities that will make a huge impact on CARICOM's trade balance, foreign exchange, and CARICOM's uh, overall economic uh, footprint from a trade perspective. We want to cut imports by 25% by 2025. So the private sector got together regionally, and we set up a number of criteria, which all of which is market driven, all of which comes from the data, tremendous data studies and work done in CARICOM. And we identified what we call seven strategic agri investment opportunities poultry, hatching eggs, corn and rice, meat, uh, cassava, coconuts, etc. cetera. Uh, we have a document on that, wouldn't spend much time on it. The number that we're looking at at this placing in terms both of exports, very important, and imports is 418.8, nearly $420 million. But I want the colleagues to look at this very quickly. I think this is important for a forum of this nature. When you look at CARICOM Street performance up to this point, we make the point that poultry meat, for instance, has been under lockdown. Hatching eggs, we call it, has been under lockdown. Corn and rice, uh, we've had movement in rice, but no movement in corn. And meat imports have been under lockdown. So we, we use the term lockdown to show that when you look at CARICOM Street performance for poultry meat, hatching eggs, corn, and meat, you virtually get no intra-regional trade in those products. And what we're saying is that our task as a CPSO is to try to, as it were, unlock in the presence of this, this COVID uh, environment and with the, with the regeneration of interest in agriculture. It's to try to unlock the agricultural system so that we can perform positively on these. Cassava was uh, under partial lockdown and niche vegetables. And, and here it's important because the only one that we have on the list that was totally liberalized without a significant non-tariff barriers, without other impediments to trade was coconut products. So what we've said is this. Where we are now looking at the future in the context of COVID, we need to be concerned about driving exports, cutting imports, and driving intra-regional trade. We need to do that from a perspective of private sector investment. One of the first things we want to do that, uh, that's different going forward, and we think that the platform is, has now been laid by, uh, for it by heads, is that we want to have, as it were, private sector involvement and investment in, in working with the regulatory agencies in getting the best regulatory practices instituted. And I think that's been happening uh, with the protocols that we've now agreed to have countries implement and to finalize. And secondly, private sector investment in infrastructure is gonna be critical. Uh, we can delve down on that in the discussion. I think the third point is geographically, we recognize that because of logistics and transportation, we've been, we've been close, but really we've been physically distanced because uh, it's very difficult to ship uh, efficiently to markets that are close by. And again, uh, this is important because we recognize that underlying these are some things we need to fix. Transportation, and logistic, uh, infrastructure, and systems. Those are important things that we need to work on. The second thing for us to do in trying to generate a future that's different to the past and recovery with exports, intra-regional trade, 
and cutting imports is that we need to focus on bringing technology to be the handmaiden of the agri-food system. And we need to do that, for instance, because the, the World Bank has identified that ICT red, readiness remains a drag on the growth in our Caribbean societies. And it's not, it's not trivial for agriculture. We saw recently an excellent example where ICT was used to have the pre-quarantine certificates from St. Vincent and the Grenadines cleared in Trinidad and Tobago before the vessel got in. What we would like to see uh, in the region from the CARICOM private sector's uh, organization's perspective is to have these issues drilled down the total trade. So we want to be able to have the entire shipment cleared before the vessel gets there. And that's very important because it means that we have to enable ICT. We have to bring trust and confidence in the use of the ICT to, uh, to secure our electronic payments and settlements. And that itself is another, it's another important issue, freedom of movement. Uh, we, Antoine, heard Maxim, we have two minutes. We heard the previous speaker from FAO speak about what's happening with high valued products. And we want to underscore that because a lot of the products that we produce in CARICOM are high value. But we have a problem. The countries that have tremendous land resource are often challenged with populations. And so we need to be able to liberalize our freedom of movement. And there's some good things that we started, for instance, agricultural workers. We need to finalize that protocol. And we also need to fix the impediments that still exist in moving prof professionals, experts, scientists, uh, among and between the countries. And I think for us, the last thing to finance agriculture, we need to have more instruments. Commercial bank loans will not do it. We need to have a regional stock exchange. We need to have a CARICOM stock exchange that essentially drives private equity and removes the constraint. We need to have a junior stock exchange like Jamaica has given us an example. But we see some green shoots. There is a uh, strategic project investment facility that the CPSO has proposed to heads and they've accepted it. We need to get that going. We also want to give uh, some credit what the UWI has done with the incubator project. We see those as being uh, symbiotic. Finally, we have to make a decision. Is this going to be incrementalism or are we going to make a quantum shift? We believe that in the most difficult circumstances that we face, there is scope and room for us to make a quantum shift. The CPSO members and the private sector are now engaged like never before, and we're committed to delivering on the commitment ahead in July. Thank you. Dr. Antoine, thank you so very much, first of all, for being ready and jumping in, and also for a very thought-provoking and thorough presentation. We're going to just head quickly back in view of our time, and we're going to see if we can get back to Doc, um, Honorable Minister Saboto Caesar. Minister, are you able to connect with us again? Yes, I, I am there with you now. Wonderful. <laughs> Please continue. Yes, I, I closed on the, on the issue briefly that we are moving from a drought. We are in the midst of COVID-19 and we're moving into the hurricane season. But in light of all of this, member states of CARICOM and of OECS, we have continued our meetings and with the support of the FAO and other international organizations, we were able to create a CARICOM plan. And I just want to delve into it briefly. We have been able to come up with a, a framework whereby we have identified several commodities that we want to address in the short to medium term that we can trade intra-regionally. We are now working on addressing issues of SPS protocols because we recognize that historically, we have seen these as a barrier to trade. And I want to use this opportunity to encourage the private sector to participate in this very important process. We know that historically the issue of shipping is one that we have tried to address and we have to improve on our efficiency and we have to come up with an efficacious system in order to move commodities on the single market and economy. I am of the view that we are going to do well in this period. However, there is a need for a recommitment by all member states, all stakeholders in the agricultural sector, 
persons also in fisheries, and we will be able to carve out a significant portion of the food import bill and create great wealth by moving more commodities intra-regionally. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Minister, thank you so very much. Um, very strong ending to your presentation. And it gives us some time. We are really interested. We have more than 500 people now and the numbers are continuing to climb. We really want to say welcome to all of our listeners from across the Caribbean and we have people from other parts of the world joining us as well. Please do send in your comments and your questions and we're going to see how best we can address them. We're moving now into the second part of our webinar where we are going to have a list of regional experts who are going to present some questions to our, our panelists. So we have with us today in order to do that, we're very pleased to have Honorable Minister Pintard, who is the Minister of Agriculture and Marine Resources from the Bahamas, Dr. Lister Fletcher Paul, who is a lecturer in biometrics at the University of the West Indies, and she is our former sub-regional coordinator for FAO in the Caribbean. And we have Mr. Jeremy Stephen, a well-known economist with a lot of background in agriculture. So this is a format that we will be using. We will start with the first question where Mr. Stephen will pose his question to Mr. Maximo Torero. And Mr. Maximo Torero will have three minutes to respond. So with that, Jeremy, over to you, please, to pose your question to Mr. Torero. Okay, good afternoon. Can you all hear me and see me? Yes, you can. I must say I thoroughly enjoyed every question, every presentation that I've seen so far, uh, particularly uh, from my St. Vincent brothers, my Byzantian brothers and the minister as well, uh, who have been looking at actual technical and probable solutions addressing some concerns that I've had myself. Uh, it was good to see Senor uh, Torero uh, also give a very good macroeconomic response that was definitely sensitive to our peculiar situations. Uh, but mainly what I do have on in mind is where the issue of debt plays into it. What was said afterwards by the Honorable Minister and Dr. Antoine uh, has to be considered within the presentation or rather given more of a priority. And it's not necessarily a criticism, but rather, you know, time. <laughs> he had only just 10 minutes and I'm sure that that would have been top of mind. So the, the element is this, that in the Caribbean, particularly our small states, which are net importers, the issue of foreign reserves always comes up as a primary concern, particularly when you're not earning. It has been well established that we are not earning or not going to earn at least for the next 18 months in the traditional way. It may also be very well the case that we are going to be locked out from being able to borrow given our high um, debt propensities or our high uh, external debt propensities and our high, even higher public, domestic public debt propensities. So in that light, the whole issue of logistics and the troubles that have been spoken about and also the issues concerning other social aspects in, ter in terms of spending on health, um, that's important for us in Barbados, for example, probably even more so than others, and uh, other facets of social safety nets. My wondering is this, or my question to you really, setting up context is this. How then do you balance the whole semblance of having weakening or weakened foreign exchange earnings, weakened potential to, to maintain foreign reserves and also having to spend on different social sectors uh, as well as given that it might take some time for us in CARICOM to create the institutions and infrastructures to do so, for us to facilitate imports from extra regional sources for the time being while we quote unquote get our act together. How in our mind and your to your mind, sir, do you figure we are going to go about such or we should? Thank you, Jeremy. Maximo, uh, three minutes for your response, please. Okay, so 
That's a very difficult question. You see, uh, uh, I think that the issue right now is not an issue of uh, availability of food. I, I think food will be available. The problem is of liquidity to be able to, to access that food. And that's where you will be facing a significant constraint. And that's where I think uh, you will need to, to request uh, or to access to the multiple mechanisms that are being put in place by the World Bank, by the IMF, and by the Inter-American Development Bank. My understanding is that the Inter-American Development Bank is extremely interested in working with, with SEEDS and with the Caribbean islands. So it is, it's really important to find mechanisms to do that. Now, by doing so, what we are trying to, to say is that we need to increase, uh, do, use those resources, not only to solve the short-term problem, but also to create a mechanism that will allow you to cope in the future uh, with these situations. And that will imply something a little bit more structural, I think, for the case of the Caribbean islands, because you will need to be able to diversify uh, the sources of income that you have today. Because right now it's too concentrated on tourism, which is correct, but, but I think there is a clear need to be able to diversify a little bit more the revenue sources so that you are more protected to situations like the one we're facing today. Back to you. Thank you very much. Maximo, I do recognize that it is very difficult to keep these very complex questions or answers to these questions short. We're only doing so to be able to see if we can carve out some time for other questions as well. Thank you so much for both that question and that answer. We're moving on to the second one, which is going to be by Dr. Lystra Fletcher Paul, and she is going to pose a question to Minister Sabota Caesar. Mr. over to you, please. Thank you very much, Jillian, and good afternoon, everybody. Good to see old friends again. Um, Minister, um, you talked about, and you and Patrick Antoine talked about the importance of the private sector um, coming in, especially in terms of import substitution and the intra-regional trade. But you know that the private sector in the Caribbean is they are a group of traders. They buy cheap and sell expensive to make the best profit. What incentives can governments of the Caribbean put in place to attract private sector um, investment in agriculture in the region post COVID-19? First of all, I think one of the major problems we are facing as it pertains to inter-regional trade is the absence of organized information and marketing intelligence. I think if we take it from that standpoint, then we will not be fishing or shooting in the dark. The traders from St. Vincent and the Grenadines exporting to Trinidad and Tobago and to Barbados and to the other islands, when the vessel leaves St. Vincent and the Grenadines, the senders are, are not aware of the price that they're going to get for the commodities upon arrival. Even upon arrival in some of these markets, the persons are not aware as to what would be the buying price for that day. And this is totally different from what we are seeing taking place when persons in the Caribbean purchase agricultural commodities from outside of the region. When you go online and you make an order, it's a fixed price, and that price is what you pay. I think that the price distortions that you have within the, Car within the CARICOM single market and economy and the many uncertainties in pricing that this acts as one of the greatest negatives as it pertains to persons organizing their investments. Because if you don't have an organized marketing intelligence framework, you cannot properly calculate your return on investment. And what we are going to do within CARICOM, within the OECS framework, we are going to work to ensure that we address this matter by getting good production plans in place, getting the information available to all the stakeholders so that we are aware of what is taking place, not only at the level of production, not only at the level of export, but at the level of the marketing and what is taking place in the marketplaces on the single market and the economy. That is going to be very important and critical. And member states will, need the work of technicians working along with importers and exporters to ensure that this happens. Also, the cost for shipping is another issue that is a variable that we have to address. Thank you. 
Minister, thank you so much. And also to Listra for that question. I'm passing over to the Honorable Minister Pintard at this point for his question to Dr. Patrick Antoine. Minister Pintard, you have the floor. Thank you very much, colleagues. Thank you very much for excellent presentations. Uh, Dr. Antoine, good to see you again. Two questions. Um, first, clearly outside issues, financing uh, appears to be the second most critical issue uh, affecting agribusiness persons in the region. Uh, for those listening, are you able to mention uh, a, a list, a short list of blended financing options that should be able to assist the sector in growing and comment on that in terms of those blended financing coming one from the public sector and two from the private sector. The second part of the question then relates to the issue of uh, protectionism, which has, uh, which has historically been a bad word, but in the midst of COVID appears to be gaining some currency. Uh, how do we uh, protect the domestic producer in light of the fact that uh, this is the one opportunity uh, for many of the countries that they have to actually sell to their domestic population in the absence of the uh, tourists who uh, can no longer travel due to restrictions. Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, you're, you're absolutely um, you're absolutely spot on by focusing on finance. The first thing is that I think we need to recognize that our capital and finance markets are extremely underdeveloped. And, and again, it's not rhetoric. We've said this and Jamaica in the last five years have shown us the way in terms of the junior stock exchange. The junior stock exchange is important because the persons in the country who understand the market in which they are going to be placing funds that projects will go into, uh, they are more comfortable with the risk being nationals or diaspora than, for instance, someone who is far away who would require a project that is of a particular size and scope with a, with, with a number of other legal frameworks that, sadly speaking, most of our countries do not have. So the one I want to offer first is the Junior Stock Exchange in Jamaica. There's a recent experiment in Trinidad with it, and there have been two successful projects funded from that. We would like to see that extended to agriculture. The second one is creating a market for equities. Again, the same way where essentially groups of persons can come together with an equity management firm and they can place their funds there and have those, those funds with, with specific rules for investment uh, invested in various projects which need not only be in one country. We believe this is also right for agriculture at this time because it's not just production, it's also distribution and support services, etc. Thirdly, there's an opportunity for government at this time to use some of the borrowing power that it has, which is not a lot. I heard, uh, I heard the colleague before and blend that with private sector funding. And let me just say without giving the names of a firm that we have an interesting example now where the government is prepared to put some funding in that, with, that was already programmed for agriculture. And a private sector firm is putting a substantial amount of funds in, as it were, to create a new entity that services agriculture from the standpoint of providing critical intermediate inputs to a large industry. That we believe is, is, is one of the ways that we need to move in agriculture. Second question, in terms of servicing, the, in, in terms of displacing the product and the imports and the supplies that went into tourism, this is a challenge. What have we been doing? We've been supporting the countries now. Um, Mr. Cox will see a document shortly from the CPSO where we've been helping them design protocols and guidelines first so that the system can begin functioning again. Uh, and and, and this, this is important. We had to make a presentation where we argued that, look, for agriculture to move, we have to unblock distribution. We have to unblock retail. We have to unblock supermarkets. We have to unblock the small stores. Because unless those are unblocked, we're not going to get the agricultural system being responsive. And so we believe that 
the way that we need to do that is to unblock it and then target it to the, uh, to the, to the public sector institutions, to the prisons, to the schools, to the hospitals. We need to have a policy now where regionally we come together with a framework that says that we will use regional products to supply those institutions first. And we know that in the context of emergency support, we can find a framework in the WTO and in the CARICOM Treaty to do it. So those are the things that I want to suggest at this time that we need to embark on as a matter of priority. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, both for the, the, the very good questions, Minister Pintard, and for the very passionate and spirited response. I'm going to now ask Dr. Lystra Fletcher-Paul if she would pose a question for the Assistant Secretary General, Joseph Cox. Lystra, over to you, please. Thank you very much, Jillian, again. Um, Mr. Cox, one part of this solution that is being proposed for intra-regional trade has to deal with cross-border investments in agriculture because some of these small countries have businessmen who may be able to invest in some of the bigger countries for production on a larger scale. What are the main constraints to cross-border investments in agriculture? And what programs does the CARICOM Secretariat have to support cross-border investments in the Caribbean post-COVID-19? Well, in terms of that, that's a very, that's a very good question. And the, the, answer, the answer for you um, in this respect would be that is a work in progress. Uh, for the simple reason that, yes, there are, there, are, there are some issues, a lot of them obtain at the, the local level. And we've been trying to sort out some of the challenges with legislative fixes over the, over the years, and we'll continue to do so. Because the simple fact of it is that Whereas there is, there is tremendous latitude and not many restrictions in terms of cross-border movement of capital, et cetera, the challenge is sometimes up, um, obtained at the local level with some of the nuances that are introduced at that point. And we are working very closely with the member countries to see if we can treat with those matters and are, are just being absolutely expeditious because we do recognize that coming out of the COVID-19 pandemic, that this is going to be, this is a brand new, brand new ball game. And for us to res respond, it's not just a matter of cross-border investments. It's an issue, or in the classic sense, it's also a matter for us finally as a region to grapple with the issue of production integration. There are some synergies that can be obtained with that sort of cross-border in interaction that we have yet um, been unable to, to capitalize on. And I dare say, in this new, this new world, as it were, or that we are going into, that would be, have to be part of the focus. But in terms of the immediacy of, of the question, this remains a, a work in progress, and we are working expeditiously. We, we can say with some amount of conviction that there is, you can clearly see that there is an interest, there is an impetus, renewed impetus in terms of regional integration. And therefore, I dare say that the solution is probably not too far away. But right now, it remains a work in progress. Thank you very much, Assistant Secretary General Cox. We have had a really rich discussion so far. And there are more than 560 persons who have joined and are listening into this discussion. There are a lot of comments and some questions coming in. Very interesting questions. Many of them have already been answered, I think, by the panelists, but we're going to just take two that we have gotten. Please know though, that the rest of your comments and questions are going to be taken from the site and we are going to put them together and they will be addressed. We won't necessarily have the time because we are committed to keeping this, this um, webinar within a particular period of time, but we will be having other webinars and other opportunities to continue this discussion. So um, for this, I'm going to, I've been given a few questions and I'm going to start by posing these to the panel. I will say that anyone who wishes to respond may do so. And I'll start with this first one. The question being posed is, is there any chance to coordinate the use of food supplies 
that the tourism industry will not be using now because of low demand? How can agriculture help with absorbing workers from tourism? That's the question that's been posed by one of our listeners. And I'm going to hand over to the panel. Dr. Antoine, would you like to take a, a stab at that? Um, Dr. Antoine, you're, you're still muted. Yes, thank you. I think that question is the 100 ton gorilla in the room, having regard to what um, I believe was said from the presentation by uh, the FAO speaker, the chief economist, and myself in terms of the numbers showing tourism and, and uh, tourism growth and imports. My own view is that um, it is going to be difficult for us to displace pound for pound um, what, is, uh, what has been demanded by tourism um, with what is consumed domestically. I think a proportion of that, as I said earlier, we can look at markets for it regionally, but that calls for us to do some urgent things which are possible. Let me repeat on this call. It is possible to do those things, for instance. What Minister Saboto and they did with Trinidad is just an example of what we thought was not possible before. Before, the technology was there, but we heard it wasn't possible to reduce transactions costs. Why is this important? Because to sell a lot of those things that went into tourism, we're going to have to be at a price point where we're competitive regionally because disposable incomes are falling, people are going to be out of work, and so they will be stretching their dollar further. So a proportion, yes. All of it, I don't see it in the short run. So what do we do? We can get our heads to coordinate themselves and try to come up with a regime where we can begin thinking about opening our economies on a regional basis based on the science. At some stage, we have to get out of lockdown. If we are able to do that, to open up regionally together, now the rest of CARICOM can still be ring fenced. But if Trinidad is safe and Barbados is safe because we have had no cases over 28 days, we can begin stimulating intra regional tourism in a bubble in the meantime. That is going to help take up some of this demand. That is what is exciting the private sector right now. Um, Joseph Cox is on the call. How we do it is another thing, but we believe that's one of the first phases that we can enter. That's why I would answer that question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Joseph, would you like to add anything to that? No, well, I mean, I, I agree with I agree with Patrick. The, but the, the thing is simply, is, and that is why we have gone the route of, the, of uh, developing some defined metrics with which we can operate in concert, because mm -hmm. in Yes, that it will be an opportunity for some of the surplus that now obtains in the in the agriculture to be obtained to be absorbed by an, an uptick in interregional trade. But it also creates the opportunity and redefines, in some respects, the role of the state. One, and it also highlights some of the dysfunction in our price mechanism, because truthfully, what you have found in the market is that. Yeah, for example, you have a surplus in eggs in Jamaica and Barbados, I believe. But the truth be spoken is that there has not been an attendant adjustment in terms of price. And therefore, what you have to do, you have to seek to treat with how do we deal with some of that? Where how can we boost demand by having the um, normal and practical realignment of prices? But at the same time, also look at the opportunities that, that are not being created for the state to sometimes to intervene, to drive from the farm to fork programs, um, and for the private sector also to look at for the medium term, the, a, a real investment in terms of um, agro-processing. So that we can actually optimize what we're going, what we're getting out of the, the market. Good. Thank you so much. We're going to squeeze in one quick question, one last question, so that um, before we go, we have maybe five or so minutes left, and I'm going to ask. This one is for Minister Caesar. Could you give us an example of public policy, specifically for small farmers? that may be applied on the recovery of agri-food chains. Minister? Thank you very much, Madam Chair. We, we established very early o'clock in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and it is taking place in uh, many of the other member states of CARICOM, OECS. 
whereby we have taken stimulus packages to our parliaments. What we are seeing is that we recognize that persons are in need of capital in order to fuel and to stimulate their investments. And we are investing at all levels of the value chain. For example, in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, we are working with, with CADI, the Ministry of Agriculture, other friendly governments to ensure that seeds and seedlings are provided, that we have different breeds of animals being brought into the country to bolster our livestock sector. We are working with the fisher folk to ensure that boats are available. And we have in St. Vincent and the Grenadines a farmer support company that is given concessionary rates. We are speaking to lenders in our country to ensure that farmers have capital as a very important factor of production. Not only is capital important, but we are working with stakeholders to ensure that a lot of the, the wastage that we had hitherto, that we remove a lot of this wastage and we, we replace it with efficiency. And it has started to augur very well for production and productivity. And we are seeing where this is assisting a lot of the farmers and stakeholders in the agriculture sector. Very good, thank you so much. We've really had a rich discussion. I am sorry that we can't continue, but I think quality is always better over quantity. Well, not always, but it, it, it's, it's quality over quantity is often very good. I'm going to now hand us over to Dr. Renata Clark, who is the FAO Subregional Coordinator for the Caribbean, who will provide us with some closing remarks. We wanna first of all say thank you though, before we do that to all of you, more than 560 persons who joined us. And we will give you some more information about the, the presentations and the recording being available after this for you to share with your colleagues and with your partners. Dr. Renata Clark, Renata, over to you, please. Thank you, Jillian. I'll first of all very quickly go over some of the main messages that came out of this extremely interesting discussion. The first message coming from Maximo Torero was that at a global scale, there is no shortage of staples. In fact, we're, we're, we're in a bumper period. He noted that logistics require attention, otherwise we will see disruptions in some chains, particularly labor intensive and high value chains. He noted that there are very negative projections for, for global GDP loss and gave a figure of about 6% reduction for the Caribbean. There are projections about how this GDP loss will affect food security. So we all have to be very aware of our SDG targets with pessimistic projections pointing at up to 80 million food insecure. So he ended with a, a call for urgent attention to social protection programs, being aware that those in need might not necessarily be those who were in need pre-COVID. Assistant Secretary General Cox told us that the Caribbean has already spent one to 4% of GDP on containing the outbreak. He outlined the criteria and the conditions for safe reopening of the economy. And he underlined the importance of whole of country engagement in moving forward. He noted that we cannot be shy, we have to frontally address the aftershocks caused by this crisis. And he noted that there is renewed impetus for, in, for regional integration. Minister Caesar, spoke to the work of the CARICOM Agri-Food Task Force and noted that there are already programs in place for ramping up domestic production. He noted that there are a number of issues that need to be addressed to be facilitating the movement of food intra-regionally, in particular SPS issues. 
he underlined the importance of private sector engagement and continued commitment of agriculture and fisheries uh, stakeholders. He has strong belief that we will create wealth within the region through intra-regional trade, and he noted that the issue of market information, production statistics, and projections are going to be are lacking currently and need to be addressed to be facilitating this transition. Dr. Antoine warned us that the next 10 years can define where we end up. He also warned us that the private sector is a critical part of the solution. He outlined plans that were put forward by his uh, organization for reducing 25% of food imports by 2025. And he outlined a plan for seven strategic agricultural opportunities in the agriculture sector. He noted the importance of having enabling policies that will allow it, this, these plans to succeed. He pointed to best regulatory practice as something that the Caribbean needs to embrace. He pointed to the need for investment. He underlined the issue of the ICT drag, noting recent successes with the use of electronic certification as being important facilitators in trade. He also pointed to important mechanisms such as national and regional stock exchanges as being important mechanisms to, to facilitate investment, private sector investment. I would like to thank our very distinguished speakers, our very distinguished questioners as well, and our very interested public. As Gillian has said, there are more than 560 of you listening in. And we will continue to put up information on the presentations and answering some of the questions that we were not able to address. So I hope that you keep visiting the site. I would finally like to end by letting you know that this webinar is one of a series and the next webinar will be on school feeding as a strategy to reduce the effects of the pandemic on food security and nutrition. More information on the time and access details will be provided. With that, I would like to thank you again. It has been an extremely interesting and very useful webinar. Over to you, Jillian. I think with that said, um, there isn't a lot more to, to add. We want to thank very much all of our presenters and all of our experts. We really appreciate the time that you have spent and the thought-provoking information and ideas that we had. I very much am impressed with the amount of action. We're not just talking and we're not just spinning wheels. We are talking about actual practical things that are happening on the ground. We talked a lot about all of hands on board and I can see that we have a very wide variety of stakeholders that are here in this process. So I think with that, there isn't very much else to say. Thank you so much for your time, all of you, all our Caribbean brothers and sisters. Thank you all also for the people who joined us from other parts of the world. We look forward to seeing you here again and for you to continue to participate and keep checking for our sites. There are a lot of interesting things that are happening and we will be keeping you up to date with how we move forward. Last of all, everyone, stay safe, stay healthy, and please make sure you keep moving towards recovery. Recovery is what we all want and need. We're going to build back better. Thank you, everyone, and all the best for the rest of the day. <laughs>